perturbation equations for um, electromagnetic fields first, and then gravitational fields. So I'll start from the Maxwell equations. Uh, the equations become complicated enough that I'm not going to do all of the case, and then I will do it for the gravitational case. So I'll deal with gravitational. <clears throat> gravitational perturbations. And um, as I will recall um, this morning, I, I will need to expand the gravitational perturbations onto the tensor spherical harmonics that we introduced. So I'll remind you of the form of the tensor spherical harmonics. Then I will construct the general form of the perturbed uh, metric tensor. And then I will show you that I can use a gauge transformation to simplify the form of the perturbations and to go into what is called the uh, Regge-Wheeler gauge. Then I will use the Regge-Wheeler gauge uh, to work out the Einstein equations, the linearized Einstein equations in the axial case, and I'll show you how to derive the so-called Regge-Wheeler equation, the equation that um, determines the behavior of the perturbations in the axial or odd sector. And also, if I have enough time this morning, I will uh, work out the source term for the Regge Wheeler equation. So, um, so far, everything I have done um, considered a black hole space time, and then I told you we're going to superpose on this black hole space time a test scalar field or a test electromagnetic field or a test gravitational field, and we study the free oscillations of the field in the absence of sources. The only case in which I had a source term, it, it was given by the initial data uh, in the Laplace transform approach, if you remember. But realistically, whenever you have a black hole, these perturbations will have to be sourced by something, okay? like falling matter or what have you. And the simplest model you can think of is the model where you have a black hole and you have a small particle around the black hole. Say that the particle has a rest mass and not that is much smaller than the mass of the black hole. Then you can write the stress energy tensor for the particle. The stress energy tensor for the particle will be proportional to the mass of the particle. And then you can linearize in the stress energy tensor and you can study the, the oscillations of the black hole in use by the particle. So I'm going to work out this problem for the axial case because it's easier. And then this afternoon, I think we're going to spend the whole hour generalizing to the case of polar perturbations where the equations are much more complicated. OK? Um, so that's the general plan. So again, let's see if I can time it in a way that makes sense so that I will spend about 30 minutes on the Maxwell equations and then 30 minutes on the gravitational equations, the axial case, and then um, work out the particle as well. Now, yes? That you have more equations. <laughs> yeah, in, in the axial case, you will see we have only two um, perturbation functions, and uh, we can um, get rid of them. Basically, when you write down the Einstein equations, you only have three components of the Einstein equations that matter. One of them is redundant, so you end up with two ODEs, and they are very simple, and you can manipulate them, and you get something very simple. In the, in the polar case, we'll see that we need several of the Einstein equations. I believe you need five. Um, you have how many? So you have four uh, perturbation, uh, independent perturbation functions, I believe. I, I'll do the counting later. But so you, you just have more equations, and it's much harder. In fact, it's non-trivial. The fact that you can find a wave equation is non-trivial. And there's a whole uh, paragraph in Chandra's book on the reason why, in the end, you can come up with a second-order wave equation. It's, it's, 
a, a priori, there's no reason why in the polar sector you should be able to come up with a wave equation. And uh, so there's a couple of miracles happening. One is that you can actually do it, and two, that the polar wave equation is isospectral with the axial wave equation. I don't think I'm going to be able to show it, definitely not this morning, maybe in the afternoon or, or tomorrow. But yes, uh, the polar sector is, is much harder. Okay. So, uh, let's start from the Maxwell equations. For the Maxwell equations, I've shown you yesterday that I can write down the, um, the fundamental quantity, which is the um, for potential A mu, as a um, decomposition in tensor spherical harmonics that in the end looks something like this. So I will have a sum over L and M of two vectors, one axial and one polar. And the axial vector, vector will look like this. I will have a function, let me write it explicitly since there was some confusion yesterday, ALM of TNR, Y comma phi over sine theta, and ALM TNR, let me write it in this way, maybe it's more explicit, minus sine theta y comma theta. So what I've done here is I have taken the axial vector that I constructed yesterday, SA, multiplied it by a function of TNR, and this is all I have in terms of vector perturbations that have axial parity. And then I had to sum a polar vector. The polar vector will be the sum of the time vector, ety, uh, if you like. So I will have a component, FLM of TNR times y. Then I will have a second function that I call HLM TNR y. And then, on, on the sphere, I will have the vector y a, the polar vector that I constructed by taking the covariant derivative of y. And so that's going to be just k y comma theta and k l m t r y comma phi. Okay? So we have how many free functions? We have A, F, H, and K. So by using the spherical harmonic decomposition, we turn the four components of A mu into four functions of TNR. But now I will have, um, if I perform a Fourier analysis of the, of the perturbations, I will have ordinary differential equations in R for the four functions A, F, H, K, okay? And uh, how do I find those equations? Well, I write down the Maxwell equations. So I have to write down that uh, I'm using the, the same old trick to write them down in terms of ordinary derivatives, okay? And then I also have the definition of the stress energy, what is it called? The stress energy, uh, the electromagnetic stress energy tensor, I think. No, this is not the tensor, it's, well, whatever, F mu nu. Uh, so I had to write that, and it's F mu nu is equal to, uh, the mu a nu minus the mu a mu, which I can also rewrite as the mu a nu minus the mu a nu. And this equality is trivial, it's just because of the symmetry of the Christoffel coefficients, right? Okay, so now, now I can do it on the blackboard. <laughs> 
So what I'm going to do is I will um, fire up Mathematica and I will do, I will use these ansatz, I'll plug it into the field equations that in this case are the Maxwell equations and uh, I'll manipulate, so in the end, what, what's going to happen? That I will get four field equations for the four functions that I have, A, F, H, and K. There will be four components that correspond to the four possible values of mu, right? So I will get a Maxwell equation component T, R, theta, phi. I write them down and then I will combine them in some way. So what I expect from this exercise is that at the end I will get one equation for A, the axial part of the perturbations should decouple from everything else, and then I will get a set of three differential equations for F, H, and K. So again, there's no reason a priori why the field equations that I get for the polar sector should reduce to a wave equation. But you will see that, first of all, one of the three is redundant, and the other two can be combined into a single second order differential equation, and they can be clever enough to redefine the variable in such a way that it turns out this wave equation is the spin one master equation that we found in the previous days. And, oh miracle, the axial and polar master equations are the same. So, if I solve the master equation that I gave you in the past few days, you'll find right away the function A, and through the linear combinations that I made, you will find all three of the functions that appear in the polar sector. So, let me show you how it works in practice. Okay, I don't really, well, okay, take it with me. So, okay, um, I don't know what to use, let's see, let's see, maybe I'll try to use this. So, I'll, I start again, all of this stuff you have seen before, so I'm, I'm just gonna, gonna skip the introduction, you know, I'm just defining the metric, uh, and then I define the Christoffel symbols, the rim and reach, I don't really need those things. I only need the determinant of the metric. So all of this stuff is really, you don't really need it. This is the key step. So as you can see, I take A down, A mu, this guy, and I write it as F H A over sine theta d phi, this guy, plus k dy d theta, okay? And the sum of the other two, okay? Then I construct f down down, which is f mu nu, d mu a nu minus d nu a mu, here it is. And then I can also construct f up up, which I need for uh, the covariant derivative that appears in the other of the Maxwell equations. And now I write down the Maxwell equations. So before that, I write down, you see, this is nothing but the Legendre equation. So I, the trick is that when I plug, when I plug these ansatz into the uh, Maxwell equations, I'm going to get covariant derivatives of F mu nu. And when I get these covariant derivatives, I want to replace the y's. There could be y theta thetas by the lower order derivatives using the Legendre equation. So here I'm defining the Legendre equation, and just to make sure, I also take derivatives of that in case there should be higher order derivatives, and uh, then I can use these substitution rules to replace higher order derivatives by the lower order ones, okay? Then Maxwell is a table of the four Einstein equations that you get by writing one over that g derivative of that g f up up comma x alpha, okay? So I'm writing this. And I get four Maxwell equations that I put in a vector that is called Maxwell. And then 
I take Maxwell T, Maxwell T is the first component of these Maxwell equations, and I multiply it. Remember that there was a parameter epsilon, which is a um, smallness parameter, okay, to, uh, for the perturbations. I just defined by epsilon y, and I apply the rule YLM to eliminate the higher order derivatives. And, uh, and then I collect all of these guys and simplify. And as you can see, I find some differential equation. Then I write down Maxwell R and I find some other differential equation. This involves F dk dt, df dr, you see? It's, it's kind of complicated. It's a second order differential equation in the polar variables. Then I get another one by applying a similar trick that uh, governs the, um, the, well, the, the R component. Then I get the theta component and the phi component. Now look what happens. I have to scroll up using the mouse pad. So you see that if I look at the four Maxwell equations, the T and R do not contain the spherical harmonics. Here, I get some combination of y comma phi times a differential equation plus y comma theta times another differential equation. And here I get y comma theta times a differential equation times y comma phi times some other differential equation. But if you look at these two, they are exactly the same. You see? Term by term. So I can take a linear combination of these two guys, theta, the theta component and the phi component, and write down that this guy separately has to be equal to zero. Look, this guy contains only the axial part. It's only A, you see? So it's a differential equation for A, the guy that appears in the axial vector. And here I have another polar equation that I have to uh, consider in combination with the previous two, T and R. So I have some polar equation from here, some polar equation from here, one polar equation here, and an axial equation that is decoupled for the variable A. So the, the equation for the variable A is simple enough that you can probably tell already from the exercises we did before that this is just the um, master equation for spin one, because you see it involves f squared, two derivatives of a with respect to r, plus something like ff prime da dr. But if I introduce a tortoise coordinate like I always did before, these two terms are nothing but second derivative of a with respect to r star squared. And then I had the effective potential, and the effective, these are two time derivatives, so it gives me the second derivative of a with respect to t squared. And here I get LL plus one f over r squared, which is the centrifugal potential. If you remember, the, um, the full potential for, I write it by heart so I could make a mistake, but I wrote it down enough times that I don't think I'll make a mistake now. So uh, the general potential for spin s is, I could get a factor two wrong here. But is this a 2m or an m? You can, you can check, just tell me. But for spin one, this guy was equal to zero. And so the electromagnetic potential is just f times ll plus one over r squared. And you can read it off here. So the axial equation is fll plus one over r squared. So I recovered the electromagnetic master equation already, okay, for the axial sector. Now, the polar sector is a little more complicated. What I have to do is I take the Maxwell equation T and I differentiate it with respect to R. Then I take the Maxwell equation R and I differentiate it with respect to T. And then I take some combination of these two. Um, and then I define a variable Y. So it's probably easier if I show you the definition of the variable Y from the notes. Uh, no, no. 
Okay, so you see, I can define this variable y. So that certain combination of dth and drf. And using that definition of the variable y, I find out that y satisfies the spin one um, wave equation with the same potential. Okay, so I'm done here. And I've shown you that both the polar and the axial equations, here they are. This is what I get for y. The manipulations are done in a slightly different way in the mathematics, but you can check that it's completely equivalent. This variable y and the variable a both satisfy the, um, the same spin one master equation. And once I know this, I can find everything else. Okay? Good. So I'm done with the Maxwell perturbations. This was relatively easy. And now I can turn to the gravitational perturbations. So just it, what, what's important is that you follow the logic because for the axial gravitational perturbations, the logic will be the same and the equations will become just a little bit more complicated. The polar sector that I will do this afternoon is going to be a giant mess, but the general philosophy is the same, okay? Okay, so, um, so now I need to work with the, with the gravitational perturbations, and I'm going to need some space on the board, so I will erase and... Uh, So the reason I'm making space is that I want to write down first the schematic form of the um, tensor spherical harmonics as we derived them yesterday. So I'm not going to write them down in full, but I will write them down what they look like. So I have a total of seven polar harmonics, if you remember, that I constructed in this way. So I have an A naught. I'm not going to write LM for each of the harmonic, okay? I'll, uh, I just want you to remember what they look like. A naught is Y zero, zero, zero. Okay, then I have a1, and then I have A, And these are the ones where I take the scalars in the TR sector and multiply them by Y. Then I have a B naught. I'm omitting all prefactors, okay? Just, I just want you to get an idea of the structure of these things, which is zero, YA zero, zero, well, I shouldn't write zero here, I should write symmetric. So I'll put a dot. All these tensors are always symmetric, so I can write whatever is up there, and by symmetry I obtain what is on the other side, okay? They're symmetric tensors. Then I have B. B was uh, the same thing, but This is obtained by symmetry, and this is zero. This is the theta phi sector. And then I have F. So the way I wrote them yesterday, I wrote here Z, A, B. And then I had G, which was zero, 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 zero. And then I put gamma A, B, Y here. Now, if you remember, this Z is two covariant derivatives. I write it down. It's something like this. 
nabla A, nabla B, Y, plus some LL plus one that I will omit, gamma A, B, Y. So I can either take the two harmonics F and G, or I can take nabla A, nabla B, Y, and gamma A, B, Y. They're linear combinations, okay? I can choose them any way I want. Hmm? So these are all the polar ones. And then I have the axial ones. And the axial ones look like this. I have C naught. Maybe I'll use a different color to remind you that they are the axial harmonics. So I have C naught. C naught was zero. Oh, I always make the same mistake. So this is obtained by symmetry. This is SA, zero, zero, okay. Then I have C, C is zero, zero SA, symmetry, zero. And then I have the third one, let me make space again, C not C and D. D is the one that I get by taking 0, 0, 0, and down here I put S, A, B. S, A, B is the pseudo vector that I get by taking nabla A, S, B plus nabla B, S, A. Remember? So I have, these are all the harmonics. Now if I want to construct, my goal here is to write down G mu nu as G mu nu of the background, the Schwarzschild metric, plus some perturbation H mu nu. So this H mu nu now contains 10 components because it's a symmetric tensor. The 10 components will now, the 10 degrees of freedom of those 10 components will translate into 10 coefficients of the 10 tensor spherical harmonics that are all functions of TNR. So I will have 10 functions of TNR. The most general way that I can write this down is, so let me write it down in the following way. I can write it as, if you remember I introduced the notation at some point where I was using lowercase Latin letters for T and R and uppercase Latin letters A and B for the theta phi part of the metric. Okay, so let me reuse that notation. And uh, what this translates to is that I can have some H A B of T R theta phi equals to H bar A B L M T R times Y L M theta phi. You see what I'm doing? And then I had to sum over L M. So basically I'm saying that the components H A B T R can be written as some functions of T N R multiplied by Y. You see? They are the guys up here. Okay? Then I'm going to have the HAA components, TR phi, that will be, let me omit the LM. I have already omitted a sum here, okay? Just for brevity, let me drop the LM so I don't write too much. This will be some HA polar, two quantities, functions of TNR, Y A plus H A axial of T N R times D S A. These are basically these guys, two of them polar, plus these guys, two of them axial. Okay? And then, so these are, this is a total of three functions because HAB is symmetric in TNR. So I have H11, H12, H22, 
and h21 is equal to h12 by symmetry. Here I have how many functions in total of TNR? Huh? Well, I have one, two, three, four, right? Okay, because there are two vectors. Small a runs over TNR. So I have two polar variables and two axial variables. These are all polar. Four functions, sorry, three functions polar. Here I have two polar of TNR, nabla A, nabla B. Y plus, plus, two H TNR, SAB. So this is the part on the sphere. I told you this ZAB was nabla A, nabla B plus gamma Y. And I wrote it as nabla A, nabla B times some function. Then gamma A, B, Y, I multiplied by some other function. This is a linear combination of these two. No harm done, I can do it. And then I have the polar, sorry, the axial part, SAB. So I have a total of three more functions here. Two of them are polar, K and, uh, K and G, and one is axial. So again, I have two polar, one axial function, okay? Okay, I'm omitting prefactors, the mess is in the prefactors, but the, the structure is quite clear. All right, so how many do I have in total? I have three plus two plus two polar, seven, corresponding to the seven polar harmonics, and two axial plus one axial, three axial, corresponding to the three axial harmonics, okay? All right. Now, I could be dumb and take this giant mess and plug it into the Einstein equations because I have a total of 10 degrees of freedom, 10 equations, and just look at the mess and try to make something out of it. But that's not the way you usually do things in general relativity. In general relativity, fortunately, you have general covariance. So you have your freedom of choosing the coordinates any way you want. You'd better use the coordinates in such a way that you make the equations as simple as you can. So the trick now is that we want to introduce a gauge transformation that kills four of these uh, perturbation variables so that the equations are as simple as I can make them. So the gauge transformation, I'm not gonna work it out in detail, but I'll tell you how it works. It works in the following way. So uh, how do I make a gauge transformation in general? Well, what I do is that I say, in this case, I'm doing perturbation theory. So remember, I'm sure you have seen the derivation of the wave equation in linearized gravity around Minkowski spacetime. So what do you do in that case? You write that your metric G is eta mu nu, the Minkowski metric, plus h mu nu. Then you linearize in h. Then you get a wave equation, well, you get an equation that doesn't look like the wave equation. And then you make a gauge transformation, a linearized gauge transformation on H that simplifies H as much as possible. In that case, what you do is you take H prime mu nu equal, let's say, let me follow the notation that I have here, H mu nu minus D mu psi nu minus D mu psi nu, right? Where these covariant derivatives are computed with respect to the background that in the case of the derivation of the wave equation that you have done following, I don't know, Schultz or whatever, the background is just Minkowski. So those nabla are the covariant derivatives with respect to the flat space-time metric. In the, yes? Oh, G mu nu zero is the Schwarzschild metric for me now. Okay? Uh, um, now, what I want to do is exactly the same thing, but now these covariant derivatives, let me mark them with an overbar, will be covariant derivatives computed with respect to the background metric G0, which is the Schwarzschild metric. So for each of the components of my perturbed metric tensor, I can 
make a gauge transformation like this, where xi is my gauge vector, and the nablas, nabla over bar, denote the covariant derivatives with respect to the Schwarzschild metric. Okay? Is it clear? I can, this, you can think of it in the following way. I'm linearizing in H. Xi is a small vector, it's a small gauge vector that is perturbatively of the same order as the metric perturbation H. So when I take the covariant derivatives, I don't need to include perturbations in the nablas because I would, take, I would obtain terms that are of order H squared. So I can omit them and I can take these covariant derivatives with respect to the background, okay? So you still need to compute the Christoffel coefficients of the Schwarzschild metric and this gauge transformation is a little more complicated than uh, the standard one that you do in the derivation of the wave equation, but it's the same logic. And now the trick is that the gauge vector, it's a vector, and guess what I'll do? I will expand it in vector spherical harmonics, right? So when I expand it in vector spherical harmonics, I'll get something like this. I will get a gauge vector xi axial mu that I can write as sum over L, sum over M from minus L to L, of lambda TNR and zero, zero. What will I have here? For the theta phi part. I'm gonna have SA, right? Because it's the, vec the axial vector. It's the only, for vectors, the, I obtain it by plugging in the axial vector. So I can write it down explicitly, but it's minus d nabla phi y over sine theta and sine theta d theta y. So this will be the axial vector, and I have one gauge function lambda of TNR, and then I will have a polar vector, psi mu polar, that will be um, a sum over L and M again of, I write it like this, um, psi T, I'm omitting LMs everywhere, TR, Y, psi R, of TNR Y, and then I will have some, this is sometimes called Xi electric, and this is called Xi, lambda is called Xi magnetic, but okay, Xi electric of um, TR, um, D theta Y, Xi electric TR, D phi Y. So you recognize these two guys are YA, the vector harmonic. These two guys are SA. How many functions do I have? One, two, three polar, one axial. So I can use this gauge freedom to set to zero one of the axial functions and three of the polar functions, right? And that's what I'll do. The choice that Reg and Wheeler made, which is not unique, you can make others, is to set this guy equal to zero. So I have killed two polar functions. This guy equal to zero. I ran out of freedom for the polar functions and This is equal to zero. So that's one axial function that I'm setting to zero. Okay? So I'm left. I have killed one, two, three polar functions. And I'm left with 
3 plus 1, 4 polar functions, 1 axial killed, 2 axial. So I have 2 axial functions, 4 polar functions. Makes sense? You have a total of 10 degrees of freedom. You used 4 of the three functions in the gauge transformation to kill four of them, you're left with six degrees of freedom. Two are axial, four are polar. And that's why the polar equations are more complicated because you have twice as many degrees of freedom. Okay? So now I can look at this mess and I can write down what is called, I, can I get rid of this stuff here? So now I can write down the um, perturbed metric, axial and polar, in the Reggio Wheeler gauge, following the logic that uh, I just told you. And in the uh, axial case, so now I fix the gauge, okay? Reggio Wheeler gauge. I have h mu nu axial. This is equal to 0, 0. And here, everything is obtained by symmetry. I wrote only the upper diagonal components because the tensor is symmetric, okay? And the polar sector, well, I'm not gonna need it this morning, but I write it down for reference. You have, it's written usually like this, F H naught Y, H one Y, 1 over f h2 y 0 0 0 0 r squared k y r squared sine squared theta k y 0 and the rest by symmetry so you see that i plugged in the Schwarzschild metric, so that this is f1 plus h not y, because I remember that I had to sum the background. The background are polar functions along the axis, so I have f1 over f r squared, r squared sine squared theta, and the perturbation functions. Um, so I'm left only with k. Gamma ab is 1 sine squared theta, if you remember. K is here. H0, H1, H2 are the three that were up here. Clear? Okay? Now the work begins. Because all I've done is I told you this is how you write the metric. Now you have to write down the field equation. Okay. So, um, I'm not going to write down the field equations on the blackboard, but I'll fire up Mathematica again. Okay. So, usual story. I'm going to work as in the case of the Maxwell perturbations, except that now I have to write down the Einstein equations, not the Maxwell equations. So, the Einstein equations are going to be g mu nu equals zero, because for now I'm considering 
the homogeneous case where there is nothing exciting the perturbations of the black hole. But when I write down the Einstein equations, I will linearize in H. So every time I get something that is higher than, uh, say, H naught, whatever is of order H naught squared, I'm going to drop. Whatever is of order H one squared, I'm going to drop, and so on. And I will keep only whatever is linear in the perturbations. That's the trick. I'm doing linear perturbation theory. Also, another trick, I told you that uh, typically mathematica or algebraic manipulation software um, of any kind suffers when you deal with trigonometric functions. So I'm going to introduce, if you remember the very first lecture, something that I called uh, rational polynomial coordinates, where basically the trick is that you call chi equal cosine theta. So whenever you have sine squared, it's one minus cos, one minus chi squared, and so on. So I'm introducing chi instead of theta, and uh, I'm writing down the uh, g down down metric, which is, you see, the diagonal components, I'm doing the axial perturbation, so I'm dealing with this. The diagonal components of the metric here will be the Schwarzschild metric, because I have to write down G naught plus H. I'm writing down G naught plus H axial. So the diagonal components are just the Schwarzschild metric, but in rational polynomial coordinates. And then I have G03, let me scroll with this. G03, G13 are nothing but these guys, where are they? here, you see, but they are written in terms of the rational polynomial coordinates. So sine theta is, uh, I write one minus chi squared y prime and so on. So these things are exactly equivalent and then you see metrize, okay? So, um, yeah. Then uh, you write down, as usual, the rule to eliminate the second derivative of YLM uh, using the Legendre equation by written in terms of chi. And this um, epsilon is an order parameter that you use to linearize in whatever you have. So this command will basically linearize everything at order order that you choose, which is going to be linear. Oh, here, first, sorry. First order xx is the command that linearizes everything in terms of the perturbations at order epsilon. So you see that I keep a bookkeeping epsilon parameter here, and I'm going to linearize everything in terms of that. So then you write down the Christoffels and so on, and then you write down your equations. Okay, so these I want to actually write down because they're simple. They're surprisingly simple when you consider everything. Because I have three equations that involve the two functions, H0 and H1, and uh, there are only three components that matter, as I was telling Bala at the beginning. They are the 0, 1, 0, 2, and 0, 3 components. So TR, T theta, T phi components of the Einstein equations. And uh, uh, they they are simple enough that I want to write them down. I write them down because I have something in mind. I'll, I'll, I'll use them later when I do the derivation of the Reggio-Wheeler equation with the source term to show you at least schematically how, how it works. So they are like this. Now I'm, I'm obtaining the Reggio Wheeler equation. I'm writing down the Einstein, the linearized Einstein equations in, the, in, the, in this background. And what I'm finding is that they have this form. The T phi Einstein equation is giving me, I write down everything, 4m minus L, L plus 1, R, H naught, 
plus i r r minus 2 m multiplying to omega h1 plus omega r h1 prime minus i r h naught double prime equals zero. Then I have the r phi component of the Einstein equations that gives me 2i r squared omega h naught plus r minus 2m, 2 minus cell minus cell squared plus r squared omega h1 minus i r cube omega h naught prime equal 0. Theta phi gives me i r cube omega h naught plus r minus 2m 2m h1 plus r r minus 2m h1 prime equal zero. So, bad but not, not so bad. I have three equations and two degrees of freedom, h naught and h1. It turns out that you can obtain one of these three equations as some combination of the other two. So, of the three equations, the first, the first is irrelevant. If you look at the notes, there's a footnote that tells you, take the following combination of equation two and equation three, and you will see that you get equation one. That's enough to forget about equation one from now on. And it makes sense because we have two degrees of freedom, so the three equations cannot be all independent. The other two are. So now what I have to do is work on this guy and this guy. I can forget about this guy. And I can work on the second and third equations to cast them in the form of a wave equation, which is what I want to do. So how do I do that? I take this equation here, look at, look at the shape. It is H naught, let's say a linear combination of H naught, H1 and H1 prime. So it makes a lot of sense that I take this equation, I solve for H naught, and I find H naught as a linear combination of H1 and H1 prime. Let's say that this equation will give me H naught equal, what do I write here? Alpha H1 plus beta H1 prime. Okay, where alpha, you can read out alpha and beta from here. You take this and you plug it into the R phi equation. When you plug it into the R phi equation, you get H1 plus H1 prime plus H1 plus derivatives of H naught. Derivatives of H naught are going to give you derivatives of H1, derivatives of alpha and beta, whatever, and second derivatives of H1. So you will get a linear equation that contains h1 double prime plus h1 prime plus h1 equals zero. And now you define, so you, you get something like this. Okay, this gives you some c1 h1 double prime plus c2 h1 prime plus c3 h1 equal zero by plugging into this guy here. Okay? And now you just define H1, you redefine instead of H1 some other function psi that will kill the first derivative when you introduce the tortoise coordinate and that will be your Reggie Wheeler function. So it's not too complicated. It turns out that what you need to do is you define the Reggie Wheeler function psi minus that I will sometimes also call Z minus as one over R F, F is one minus two m over r, okay, h1. And that's all you need to do. 
And then it also turns out that because H0 is obtained in this way, you see from H, from Z I can get H1. And from H1 I can get H0. Right? And it turns out that H0 is given by uh, I over omega D dr star of R psi minus, I called it. Problem solved. Okay? And if you do this, uh, you know, properly, plugging in all the coefficients and doing the manipulations that I told you, you will see that the potential that appears in the wave equation for psi minus is the Reggie Wheeler potential, that is this guy with s equal to now. Okay? So I've shown you that the scalar perturbations of a black hole, the electromagnetic perturbations of a black hole, and the axial perturbations of a black hole all satisfy the same master equation. Now I've done it, at least in the homogeneous case where there is nothing on the right hand side. Thirty minutes left, so I'm perfectly on time. And now what I want to do in the uh, rest of this morning is tell you something about what happens when uh, instead of having a black hole which is oscillating freely, you have a black hole that is excited by a particle that is falling in. So I'm going to need at least schematically these things, but I will not need this stuff anymore, so I'm going to get rid of it. And in fact, I think, let me, let me see, I'm not gonna need the screen from now on this morning, so I think we can pull it up, okay? Thanks, Ajit. So if you keep looking at that, uh, the, all the manipulations are done in the file, and you can see at the end that you get the Reggio Wheeler equation. It's all there. But schematically, what the file does, what the mathematical notebook does, are the operations that I describe here, okay? Okay. So the next step um, is this. I want to describe the perturbations of a black hole induced by a particle falling into the black hole. You see something, sorry. Um, did I lose stuff? Well, okay. So. Um, suppose that you have a particle that is moving on a geodesic in your black hole background, and this geodesic is given by, let's say, z mu of tau, where tau is the proper time of the particle. From the proper time, sorry, from, uh, from the geodesic you can compute the four velocity, U mu is dz mu d tau. So you may already complain, if you want, that I'm not justified in taking a particle and letting it go on a geodesic of the background. Because if I take a particle and the particle is falling in, say, the system will emit gravitational radiation. And so the metric will change as the particle moves in the black hole background. What I'm doing is I'm assuming that I can neglect the effects of the back reaction so that I will ignore the radiation and assume that the particle is not affected by the radiation and just falls along a geodesic. And this is a very good approximation. It's like I'm neglecting things of order h squared, if you like, something like that, okay? So, uh, 
I will not uh, derive this expression because there is a very lengthy and detailed derivation that I had never seen before in Poisson and Will. And once again, I'm grateful that they put it there. It, so they describe in, uh, in a lot of detail how you can write down the stress energy tensor for a particle, first in special relativity and then in general relativity. And they go through a very detailed explanation of how a point particle is an idealization in general relativity because there is nothing like a localized object, but you know, you can assume that you describe this object as moving along a, a, a world line where everything is basically defined in terms of a delta function and you have a point moving around on, on the world line. So if you play this game, you get that your, I will set C equal one, your and G equal one as usual, your T mu nu is given by integral of U mu U nu delta of X mu minus Z mu of tau over square root of minus g d tau. So this is a result that is, like I said, derived in uh, detail in Poisson and Will. They derive it in flat space-time first, and then they explain how you go from flat space-time to curved space-time. And basically, the, the real new thing is the square root of minus g there that takes into account the volume element in a curved space-time. Okay. So, now, um, what I want to do is switch from uh, proper time to coordinate time. And I have my reasons for doing this. I want to switch to coordinate time because when I expanded the Einstein equations and made my um, Fourier analysis, I Fourier analyzed everything in terms of the time t that appears in the Schwarzschild metric. And that's the coordinate time t at infinity. It's not the proper time along the trajectory of the particle. So instead of using proper time here, I want to use the coordinate time t. And if you like, this factor dt d tau is nothing but the gamma factor of the particle as it moves along in the uh, space-time. That's what it is, right? So it's, it's the redshift factor along the trajectory of the particle. And uh, uh, so if I do this, I can rewrite these guys, for example, as uh, dt d tau also you will see this notation in the notes. Sometimes I, use, sometimes I will use capital T, where this capital T, capital theta, capital phi, capital R, denote the solution of the geodesic equation for the trajectory of the particle. So eventually, when I perform this integral, I will evaluate everything at the trajectory of the particle, and the trajectory I will denote by capital letters, okay? So it's not any coordinate R, is the coordinate R that describes the trajectory of the particle as a function of time t. So uh, I will describe this, uh, I'll, I'll redefine this as dt d tau squared times dz mu dt dz, dz nu dt. And uh, then I can integrate all of this and I will obtain that T mu nu is equal to m naught over square root minus g times dt d tau dz mu dt dz mu dt times delta of r minus capital R of T, delta of theta minus capital theta of T, delta of phi minus capital phi of T. Right? I perform the integral. I switch from tau to T. 
I plugged in all the factors of the TD tau that I need. There is one that comes from here and two that come from there. One cancels the squared. And uh, so I get this, one over square root of minus g, d z mu dt, d z mu dt, times this series of deltas that tell me that I had to evaluate everything at the trajectory of the particle, okay? So now, what is this guy? This guy is r squared, or if you like r squared, well, okay, I'll write it as r squared, sine theta. Hmm? Because it's the square root of the coordinate r evaluated at uh, the position of the particle. So it's something like this, with an absolute value, if you like. And let me put an R, it doesn't matter, it's the same, okay? So, um, now I can play this trick. Delta of theta minus, so you probably know this identity. Uh, if you have the delta of a function of x, delta of a function of x is equal to sum over i of delta x minus xi over Have you seen this before? This is an identity for the delta functions. The xi's are the zeros of f of x. And you can turn the delta of any function into the delta, well, it's what I wrote. So I can get rid of the sine theta here and rewrite this as delta of cosine theta minus cosine of theta of t because my f of x now is the cosine of theta, one over f prime is the sine with an absolute value, so I can get rid of this sine theta and I can introduce an object which is delta of cosine theta delta of phi, and that's, a, I will call it a delta of omega, because every time I do an integral over the solid angle, the integral over the solid angle will be an integral of integral sine theta d theta d phi, or integral d cos theta d phi. And so these two deltas are exactly what I need when I perform integrals over the solid angle. So I will call this delta of omega minus omega of t. So at the end, what I get is that t mu nu is equal to uh, m naught over r squared, I write it with a lower case because it doesn't matter, there is a delta, so in the end, uh, dt d tau, dz mu d tau, dz mu d tau, and uh, I have a delta of r minus rt, delta 2 of omega minus omega of t. Okay? Now, this is still not what I need because the Einstein equations that I wrote down were the lower case perturbations, so I will need to compute t mu nu downstairs, but that's, that's simple. All I need to do is say t alpha beta is equal to g alpha mu g beta nu t mu nu. And this, this is the object that I will have to put on the right hand side of the Einstein equations. Actually, not, I'm not quite done yet because this is t mu nu, but just like I decomposed h mu nu in uh, tensor harmonics, I also have to decompose t mu nu in tensor harmonics. So I construct this guy out of the trajectory of the particle, and then I have to project it onto my uh, spherical harmonics that I wrote down before. And I do it just like I did for the um, perturbed Einstein tensor, what I do is I take inner products 
between all of the harmonics that I had before, and I compute the coefficients. So for example, uh, I will have something like CT for the axial sector, where C was the spherical harmonic C. I have three of them, if you remember. I call them C, C0, and D. So I will get three coefficients that come from those three harmonics. But now remember also that because I had only two degrees of freedom, I'm working on the axial case for this morning. Forget about the polar because it's more complicated. In the axial case, I will have three coefficients. I will have CT, C0, T, and I will have D, T, right? In principle, there could be three coefficients of the stress energy tensor that enter the source on the right hand side of the Einstein equations. In practice, I'm lucky because of the three Einstein equations, only two were independent. So only two of these coefficients are actually going to matter when I compute the stress energy tensor on the right hand side. Okay? So I write in general that T mu nu for the axial sector, which is the one I'm interested in today, is equal to sum LM of Q naught C naught. I omit the LMs, they're everywhere, okay? Well, I'll, there's not too many. Plus Q LM C LM plus D LM D LM. Okay? So, there's a reason I wrote these things down. Because when you, um, when you perform, now, what you can do is go back and look at the shape of these harmonics that unfortunately I had to erase because I didn't have enough space on the blackboard. But you will see that um, this guy will contribute to the TR phi component because the C harmonic is the one that contains terms that uh, depend on, you remember how, how I constructed them. This C guy, even though I don't have it anymore, was zero, 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 TR, and it's axial, so I have SA here and zero here. That's what it was. So this is the one that contains the R phi part, okay? So the R phi component of the Einstein equations, when I do the projection, will be proportional to what I call Q here. So roughly speaking, on the right hand side of this guy, I will not have zero anymore, I will have Q. With some coefficient that I have to compute, but it's Q, okay? And uh, then this other guy, theta phi, the theta phi component will depend on the LM. So that, that's because, again, if you look at the shape of this guy, um, the DLM harmonic was the one that contained SAB. This was the one that goes like zero, zero, zero SAB. So the theta phi part will come from here. So you have to compute the projection, do it carefully, but the theta phi guy now will not be zero, it will be proportional to D, okay? With some coefficient that can depend on R, but that's the structure of the equations when you plug in the particle, okay? And D, you have to compute it. What you have to do, so you have to take all of this stuff, plug in a specific geodesic, for example, for a particle that falls in or a particle that is orbiting in a circular orbit or whatever you want. I haven't specified that. There are pages and pages in the notes where I specify to, where I specialize all of this to the case of circular orbits or to the case of a particle that falls in with arbitrary energy. Um, so in the case of a particle that falls in with arbitrary energy, Q and D are zero. 
there's no axial contribution. And can you see why? Okay, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm being naughty, but let's see. Can anybody figure out why I'm not gonna get anything from, from a radial info? The radial infall excites only the polar modes. So I have to solve the Zerilli equation that I haven't even been able to derive yet, okay? These coefficients Q and D will be excited, for example, when I have the scattering of a particle. In that case, I can excite the axial modes of a black hole. But with a radial infall, I'm not gonna do it. Can you see why? So, Think of a radial info. What would be the only non-zero components of the four velocity? Come on, be brave. Eh? No, you don't count. <laughs> you do this for a job, man. <laughs> so what did he say? TNR, right? So you only have the TNR components. And the TNR components are polar. TR they are the, the ones that we stitch the Y on top of, right? So they will only excite the, the polar perturbations, the ones that I call big H zero, big H one, you remember? But they have nothing to do with the axial perturbations. So for the radial info, the problem I'm doing now is irrelevant. But uh, let's see what I get, what I would get for the source term. You can at least get the structure of the source term because you see, once I have the Einstein equations written in terms of Q and D, what I need to do is play the same trick as before. But now, when I solve this for H naught, I will get something like these guys plus some gamma times D. Correct? I'm solving this equation for H naught. Now I also have to take into account the source, which let me say is gamma d, hmm? where the gamma I haven't computed, but it's in the notes. So I can plug it here, and uh, then I have to take this expression and replace it in the R phi component of the Einstein equations to get the Reggio Wheeler equation. When I take this guy and I plug it in here, I will get H naught, which will, will give me some, uh, some small delta d, and then I have to take derivatives of H naught. So the derivatives of H naught will give me all the stuff that I had before, plus some gamma prime D plus gamma D prime. So what I expect is that when I write down my Zerilli equation, I will get something like second derivative of psi minus with respect to R star squared, plus omega squared minus V psi minus equals something like Q with some factor, I don't know. Let's call it small q. Small q, q plus some uh, coefficients that I will make up names for, alpha tilde d plus beta tilde d prime, where a prime is a derivative with respect to r. Okay? So in the end, my source term will look something like that. And my job is not completely done yet because I still need to specify the trajectory. To specify the trajectory, I have to integrate the geodesic equations and plug them into T mu nu and get T mu nu lowercase and compute the projections and plug it in. Okay? So, um, I think I'll stop here. I have five minutes, but... I'm, I'm, I'm okay with this, okay? If you want, the actual calculations are all in the PDF files and uh, you'll see that it's much more complicated than what I sketch on the board, but at least now you can, you can follow the logic of the calculations. Okay. Coffee? Do you have any questions or, yes? Calculating? Mm -hmm. 
No, no, everything is done in general relativity. The projection, I understand that that can be confusing. The etas, they appear when you project onto the tensor spherical harmonics only. Because what I'm doing there is I'm taking the metric on the sphere and then I'm extending to the TR components the projection onto the tensor spherical harmonics that I've derived yesterday. And I do it by just taking uh, eta mu nu. But that doesn't mean that the calculation is special relativistic. It's only the extension of the SO2 decomposition to the whole space time that works that way. It has nothing to do with, there is no special relativity. It's all in general relativity here. The only approximation I'm making is that I'm linearizing. So in particular here, I'm linearizing in the mass of the particle. And this approximation is going to break down when the mass of the particle is comparable to the mass of the black hole. Or, it, more in general, if I have a particle of energy that doesn't fall from infinity, for example, it will break down when the energy of the particle is comparable to the mass of the black hole. Yeah, I'm violating the m not much smaller than m. Yes. G mu nu zero is the Schwarzschild metric. No. Yeah, yeah. 